Okay, welcome everyone to uh, this month's um, um, AS uh, section meeting. Um, we have, um, to my mind, quite an interesting talk um, to listen to. But before I introduce the speaker, just um, a little bit of housekeeping. Because there aren't that many people registered for this talk, we're going to actually keep it as a... Um, a, a, um, a standard Zoom meeting. What that means is, in theory, you can talk um, and ask questions during it. Um, probably the best way to manage this is to actually um, pop the question into the Q&A if it strikes you. It also means we're not going to have an awkward jump at the end. We'll just move from the talk into Q&A and discussion about what we've just heard. Um, so should be a, 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 none of that awkward trying to um, get down a wormhole to the next meeting between between the, the talk and us chatting together. Um, oh, not all right. Um, right, we're still on webinar format. Um, OK, so um, um, what does that mean in practice? Are you going to move us over during the meeting? It means we won't move over to meeting format at the end but we we'll allow everyone to talk at the end. Oh, OK, right. Sorry, I misconstrued that. OK, so please do drop your questions into the Q&A um, as, as you think about them during the, the talk. But it, and instead of having that awkward transition, we'll actually move into um, a, a Zoom meeting at the end of the talk. Um, so therefore, it just remains for me to introduce you tonight for, to tonight's speaker, who is Neil Johnson. And uh, Neil is uh, actually a senior software engineer at Roco UK Limited and spends his day job developing multimedia consumer products for streaming sticks, soundbars, smart TVs, etc. I mean, so his, his interests include low level embedded systems, hardware and software and the design and development of reverse engineering of electronic music synthesizers, which is where we come in this evening for from um, analog, digital and MIDI technologies. He's a member of the IET and he's our current UK section chair. And he is going to um, tell us about one of his explorations into the realm of old synthesizer equipment and that's to talk about uh, one i'd never heard of an italian synthesizer so without further ado neil um let's uh, see what things you found out because i'm seriously interested in this well thank you very much jamie that's uh, a very kind introduction um so i am going to go straight to my slides so that we can all one moment while I change gear. Yes, I mean, there's, there'll be a bit of sound as well. All right. There we go. All right. So this evening, uh, let me move these stupid Zoom things out of the way. Oh, technology, I love it. All right. <laughs> okay. So the Italian job, hacking sense of fun and me. This is, a, as Jamie said, this is a personal journey. This is something that I do out of interest. Uh, some people do crosswords. I um, mess around with analog synthesizers. It's, uh, it's intellectual, it's exploratory, and it's a lot of fun. So in tonight's talk, I'm going to introduce you to the Gen SX-1000. Where it came from, when it was on sale, and some of the technology inside it. Then we look at um, the enhancements that I've explored, both in the digital and the analog domain. And then just a few conclusions on what I've discovered and some thoughts to share with, with everybody. So here is the SX1000. It's simple it's just got one one oscillator uh, one filter it can play one note at a time so it's what we call a monosynth or monophonic synthesizer it's knobby you can see 24 controls there's there are no menus there are no um manuals i mean it did come with a manual but 
it is exactly what it is. The, the user interface is everything that you see. And I think that makes it very appealing, both to early, um, to, to young synthesists who are coming in, into the, uh, the realm, but also those who actually want to play this live. Uh, you can just grab a control and play it um, live. And it's Italian. Uh, Gen uh, Electronica was uh, was uh, an Italian company um, back in the day of the seventies and 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 eighties, when actually Italy produced quite a few um, companies developing and marketing synthesizers. We had Gen Seal, Krumar, Elka, um, a wide range of names. Uh, uh, gem all came out of, of Italy. Over the over the years, they either went out of business or got smaller or were bought up by um, tended to be um, Japanese companies like Roland. They acquired the people the rights to some of the technology. So it, Italy um, back in the seventies and eighties was quite a powerhouse of of, of synthesizer development. And so how did we get here? Where did the SX-1000 come from? So it was on the market from about 1978 until 1982. And it was aimed at the um, home user. It was widely available from home shopping catalogs. Before the incident, of course, uh, some people here may remember getting these thick, two inch thick slabs of printed, of cheap, glossy, paper catalogues, you could buy anything from um, underwear to cookers uh, and in, in, including synthesizers. And um, you had companies like Littlewoods was a very famous uh, UK company doing home shopping catalogues. Of course, when the internet came along, all that went out the window, but this is what we had before web pages. So you could buy this synthesizer everywhere. Um, Technon Technology wise, as I said, it's really, really simple. We have a, a, a high frequency oscillator that runs at about two megahertz. That drives a digital tone generator. I thought you said this was an analog synth, Neil. Yes, it is, but there's a bit of digital in it. That generates three waveforms, a square wave, sawtooth, and a pulse with some width modulation to add a bit of uh, dynamism to the sound. And that runs over uh, up to four ranges, four foot, eight foot, 16 foot, and 32 foot. So although it had quite a small 37 note keyboard, with the range switch, you could you, you, you could use it as a bass synth or uh, high end or anything in between. Interestingly, and quite a rarity at the time, a 24 dB per octave or four pole low pass filter, that's quite a lot of silicon. Most synthesizers of this age were around the uh, two pole or 12 dB per octave. Um, but this was a quite unique in having a, this four pole. And likewise, uh, two full size um, envelope generators giving us the attack, decay, sustain, and release. And as we saw on the uh, picture of the uh, front panel, that's a total of eight knobs. Um, Four for each of these envelope generators. That's a lot of real estate. Then, in, um, as well as the oscillator, we've got a noise generator chip, the MM5837. Uh, that ge generated white noise, and then with a filter to, to further generate pink noise. For a bit of animation, there's a, a single triangle LFO, and as I said, it's got a 37 key keyboard, which is digitally scanned, and it also has glide. So you can glide between one note and the other at a, a variable rate. So how come I had this synthesizer? Why, where did my interest um, come from? Well, I acquired this unit back in 2002 when uh, I was at a synth DIY um, event here in the UK. And uh, one of the attendees had brought this along as a non-working unit. Um, memory serves me, uh, he was, uh, a, um, a, a service engineer for analog synthesizers. And this was basically brought along as a, it's a piece of junk, I don't want it. So 
10 pounds later and it was mine. I found the schematics online, yay for the internet. And although it's spread across four pages, the design is actually quite simple and easy to understand. It's, it's mostly textbooks. You can get out your, your OPAPS 101 textbook and understand most of what's going on. And so that's where the journey began. Here I had a relatively simple synthesizer, easy to get into and not working. Now, I just wanna say a couple of points here. The modifications I'm talking about, these are not circuit bending. And um, you've probably seen videos on YouTube where people just have a circuit board and they stick wires at random places and, and hear what it does and go, oh, that's nice, solder a wire in. No, this journey started by analysis of the circuit diagrams, uh, spice modeling and understanding of what it's doing. And then from that point on, developed the modifications. So let's start with the digital world, even though this is supposedly an analog synthesizer. And here we have an interesting little chip. It comes from Italy, as you can tell. In fact, it comes from a company called SGS 80s, A-T-E-S, and they were um, a chip design company. They produced a range of uh, integrated circuits for organs and synthesizers. The M110 here, which is the core of the SX1000, this is a monophonic synthesizer chip. It just does one note at a time. There are other chips for doing bass pedals, there are other chips for doing organs, uh, keyboard scanners, and so on. Um, the one we're looking at tonight, as you see, is the M110. Um, and you can't get them. They are, they are not made, they were discontinued decades ago, they are rare, as rare as hen's teeth, which is how I found out um, after doing an exhaustive Google search and hunting around and one or two online sellers would have it, but they would charge an arm and a leg for them. So I thought I can do better than that. So it's a digital chip. You feed in um, a high frequency clock, it scans a matrix of keys up to 61 if you have enough. Um, and then from that, it generates a number of clock signals for generating the audio voices. It also generates um, timing signals and a whole bunch of other capabilities. As I said, extremely rare. Uh, if you can find them on eBay, they tend to go for eye-watering amounts. And in the case of this SX1000 I had, it was dead. And yeah, it's a complicated bunny. It scans a five, as I said, scans a five octave keyboard. It generates multiple output clocks for the various uh, footages. It also syncs the current proportional to frequency. And that we can use to generate a sawtooth. Uh, hook up a capacitor. The capacitor will charge um, at the rate set by the current. And then we reset it at the audio rate. Key, up, key down signals for envelopes as a built-in glide oscillator. And you can also program the, the note priority. So if you play many keys at the same time, which one do you play, the highest note or the lowest note? And it's got a few other neat features built in. A very capable chip for the time. And here's uh, a schematic, if you will, a block diagram of the internals. Um, I won't go into all the details, but you can see that we have um, over here, we've got two keyboards and that scans, um, turn the annotate on. So we, we can um, scan the keyboard here. Uh, this feeds into this. Uh, so we have a, um, a ROM here for generating the lookups to convert what happens on the keyboard to the audio. Um, we've got, outputs here for telling you which octave you're playing in. Um, up here at the top, you've got various programmable dividers and we've got the clock coming in that drives the whole, the whole thing. And also there's various other functionality down here. We can generate a variety of different output pulses, um, which are not used in the, uh, in, in the SX-1000. How do we turn that on? Let's see. Clear. There we go. Good. 
well done team. So on the M110, what to do? Um, can't buy a new chip. Um, don't really want to try to recreate it out of digital logic. So at the time I was doing a PhD in computer science, so the answer was obvious, write some software. <laughs> so we started with um, an Atmel microcontroller running at eight megahertz, um, the Atmega 8, which is eight kilo kilobytes, four kilowords of program store. Now that's enough to emulate the M110 or emulate the parts of the M110 that we need for the SX1000. But it has a UART, so we do the obvious thing, we add MIDI. And then because we have control of the software, we can extend the operating range to over eight octaves, add pitch bend, and now we can also process MIDI messages for modulation wheel, and with the help of an external DAC, we can control the filter cutoff. So now we can play along and uh, with, with one hand and with the other hand, you can operate the modulation wheel to sweep the filter up and down. So this is the chip itself. Uh, uh, this is the board. Um, it's quite a small board because an, another of my objectives is it plugs into where the M110 sat on the keyboard, on a, the circuit board underneath the keyboard. So you can see um, a long row of two rows of pins towards the bottom right. Underneath the board is a set of pins that plug into the original 40 pin socket. Top left, we've got the Atmega 8, which is upside down, um, and a crystal. And then we've got on the left, we've got a two channel DAC that, can, that generates the control current for the sawtooth and also the voltage for the uh, mod wheel. And then we've got the, the other chips, so external chips for interfacing to the rest of the synthesizer. The M110, uh, by the way, that was built out of NMOS technology and that required 12 volts. So I've also on board, we have a, a 12 volt to five volt regulator to drive the small logic. And in terms of the pitch bend range and oscillator range, here's a, a, a quick audio example of the sort of thing you could do, which you can't do with a standard SX1000 because of the limitations of the M110. Sort of Frequencies there. And as I said, there's quite a bit of software there. So we've got um, at the low level, we've got hardware drivers to talk to timers, UARTs, that kind of thing. I'm using um, a real time operating system called AVRX that was very popular at the time. Um, that makes this, the software quite easy to write, to structure. And we've got um, a block for receiving the MIDI, um, a block for scanning the keyboard. We have a note stack to tie everything together. And that then drives the oscillator controller that generates the timing signals that go out um, to, to generate all the um, clocks for generating all the tones. So that's the first half. That got me a working synthesizer. I can now play it um, both from the built-in keyboard and externally through MIDI. But we're not going to stop there because this is supposed to be an analog synthesizer. So let's have a look at the analog circuits and see what we can do. So the, uh, the main enhancements we looked at are new shapes of the LFO, um, the analog noise source, filter envelope inversion, new filter modes, self sync, and sub oscillator. We'll cover all of these. So, first of all, these, this Low frequency oscillator. Um, originally, it was just a triangle. Fine. You've got, um, as you can see in this circuit diagram, um, the original circuit you had a Schmidt trigger on the left using an op amp, and on the right, we had a, an integrator. Um, feed a square wave into the integrator that gives you a triangle wave, and then feed that into the uh, into the Schmidt trigger that converts a triangle wave into a square wave that then closes the loop as we feed it back into the integrator. So with a three-way switch and some diodes, we can actually then generate a rising saw and a falling saw. We just have to quickly race back um, 
to, to give us the fast edge and to make the timing of the LFO the, the same, I reduced the voltage uh, into the integrator when we're doing the, the saw waves. That just keeps the uh, frequency of oscillation about the same. Analog noise source. Um, those who know me through synth DOI, especially the synth DOI meetings here in Cambridge, will know that I hate the MM5837. Um, it was very popular at the time. Um, one little eight pin chip gives you a noise source. You don't have to mess around with transistors and op amps and all that nasty stuff. It's a 17 bits linear feedback shift register and it runs through about 128K or 131,000. 70 odd states, there's its generator polynomial and it's internally clocked. So the clock is whatever the chip is at the day um, that was produced on the factory. And so you have a cycle time anywhere between about one second to just a, around two and a half seconds. And you have no control over that. But consequently, with such a short cycle time, it chuffs like a steam engine. It's sort of a shh, shh, shh sound, and I'm not going to repeat that. Um, and I hate that. It, 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 you can't really use it for slow uh, environmental noise unless you want the sound of a um, ship's engine. So I thought this is the first thing we've got to fix. And so I replaced it with a true analog noise source based on the usual approach of a reverse biased PN junction with amplification. And here we have a uh, BC107 uh, doing Serling service as a noise generator. This works on the principle of um, Zener avalanche breakdown. So we reverse bias the, uh, the, the base emitter junction with a very tiny current, so about 100k feeding into it. And we pick up the, uh, the, the noise across that junction and we amplify it quite a few times. And that gives us a pretty good white noise source. And then that went into the existing circuitry that then filtered it to give us pink noise. Pink noise um, is not flat. It's, uh, it, it rolls off at high frequency. So um, it sounds more like a sort of a low engine rumble. Good for, as I said, good for environmental noise, um, engine room in, in, in computer game type of noise. And here you can see this lovely flat, this is a, a, a spectral plot of the noise source. It's rolling off at the high end because of uh, the rest of the audio path, but um, generally in the audio band up to uh, about three, four K, it's pretty flat. That's much better than no spikes in, in there, no sort of lumpy noise. Then we got into filter envelope inversion. So one use of the filter is to sweep uh, of, of the well, what the filter envelope does is it sweeps the filter up and down as we play a note. So we can increase the cutoff frequency in the attack phase and bring it down a bit to where the sustain level is and then it just rolls away with the release. But supposing we want the filter to go the other way, start at a high frequency and work down. Well, we can easily do that. We just um, have a inverting uh, op amp and we get an um, the opposite envelope. And very easy to do. We just have a, okay, a 741, it's what I had at the time as an inverter. And what we what I did is the envelope level pot on the panel, um, I repurposed it, um, disconnected the ground end and connected the inverted envelope. So that means now that no envelope or the zero position is midway. And that's actually really quite easy control to use and sweep it up and down um, or down and up, depending on what I want to achieve at the time. Now this filter, 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 a filter is, is really um, the, the, um, the hardy, if you think of the, the sort of Lowell and hardy of, 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 of an analog synthesizer. You've got the VCO, the, the oscillator generates the raw waveform. And in these analog synthesizers, which are predominantly subtractive, the, uh, the counterpoint to the oscillator is the filter. And as I said, it's quite rare for, for the time. It had a four pole low pass filter. Most synthesizers of the age had tended to have two pole. It's 
it sounds pretty good. It's half the component cost. Um, but when you're just doing a monosynth, um, you can spend a bit more uh, circuit board estate and a few more components and you get a four pole low pass filter. And this particular one is constructed from four cascaded integrators with global feedback. So it's not the other structure that's well known as state variable feedback, but is just four stages of our, the variable uh, resistor capacitor all chained together. And that gives us a low pass. But what we can do with a bit of maths and a few switches, we can combine, we can tap out these uh, intermediate signals and we can combine them in different ways um, to could produce other transfer functions, not just low pass. And um, an old friend of mine, Emily uh, Gillet from uh, Mutable Instruments, um, wrote a paper on this, uh, but based on um, a VCA chip, the SSM2164, where she provides um, very handily a table of all of the different um, weights you give to the outputs of these uh, in integrators to generate a variety of, of, of different um, filter modes, not just low pass, but high pass, band pass, notch pass, and so on and so forth. I didn't want to make my change too invasive, so I was quite frugal in which extra um, modes I added. I'll explain why in a moment. So what we're looking at is the original low pass. Um, we, we, we had none of the intermediate stages. We just had the, the output of the final uh, pole, the, the final RC filter. But if we want to make a band pass, we just need to add in a, a certain amount of two of the other uh, intermediate stages. And then finally, we can add in a little bit more and produce a three pole high pass with a one pole low pass. Now, this is uh, one of the four stages in this filter. This is a, a, one of the single poles. And this is based on a chip called the LM13700. And this is called an operational transconductance amplifier. And it looks a bit like an op amp to begin with. You've got the familiar triangle in the two inputs. There's some weird diodes going on, but we don't, we're not going to worry about that. Then we've got this strange output stage that looks like a current source with the two overlapping circles. And what that is, is the, the, the transconductance, the, 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 the ratio between input voltage and output current, we can control with another current. And that comes in at the top. Uh, let me annotate again. Um, here is the OTA, the variable current source, and that's controlled by the current coming in here. And this is this is the uh, control voltage, if you will, that uh, controls the cutoff frequency of this filter. So, so this behaves like a variable resistor, and then we have a capacitor down here. And then these two Darlington pair transistors act as a buffer. So in effect, what we've got is a, resist, a variable resistor, a capacitor, and a buffer. That is our RC low pass filter, or at least one of them. And this is tap A. Let's get rid of that. Let's clear all those. Now here is the filter in total, and now you can see the four stages. Um, and the final output is taken at the, um, the far right. We have what is called resonance. So if we take some of the output and feed it back to the input, we can make the filter response uh, quite sharp near the cutoff frequency. Um, resonance or Q or damping, any of those terms apply to this. And in this um, SX1000, it's just a manual control only. But each of these four stages is exactly the same, and we can tap off the, the uh, three intermediate stages, which I've called A, B, and C. 
And now with a rotary switch and some resistors and capacitors, we can combine these A, B and C taps to feed into the output stage. And these resistors with the, the, the ratio of the original, um, the, the main output or tap D, if you will, um, give us the required um, scaling with, because what we're doing is we are, we are summing the current. So if we want more current, then we, we use a lower value resistor. And if we go back to the table showed earlier, some of these coefficients are greater than one, so we want more current. So we just use um, a lower resistor accordingly. And this is where we sum all of these um, holes into the X and Y points. This chip in the, the, the middle here um, is, is an LM3080. That is another operational transconductance amplifier that we can use to modify its gain with another voltage. So we can automate it. This is the VCA or voltage controlled amplifier. And this sets the amplitude or the amplitude envelope of the voice of the synthesizer. Then we have a seven for one to buffer that and to drive the output. And here are some plots that I've taken from the actual instrument. Low pass filter, we all know what that looks like. Low frequency is fine, and then the response rolls off as we go up in frequency. But what about the other modes? Here's the bandpass. It's, it's not ideal. It's not a textbook bandpass, but it looks pretty good. It's in the audio range, and we can sweep it up and down and adjust the spikiness. And finally, we have this hybrid high pass with a little bit of low pass. So we still get some low frequency content, but as you can see, the, the slope of, of which you will hear moving up and down is definitely a high pass response. And as I said earlier, um, at the high end of the audio range up to 20 kilohertz, it rolls off due to, to, to other um, filters in the audio path. So that's the filter. So we, 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 we've started off with our harmonically rich waveform from the VCO and we've subtracted um, various parts of the spectrum using a filter. But we can do quite destructive things with the oscillator as well. And one of the more um, interesting uh, uh, additions is this idea of a self sync. So normally what we could talk about uh, in electronic music when we are synchronizing oscillators. We have one oscillator syncing another oscillator, and that gives quite harsh tones as the two oscillators fight over um, um, sort of synchronization and, uh, and so on. So where does self-sync come from? So all I do is um, I set a synchronization level manually, and when the sawtooth reaches that point, it, it resets. Now that in itself sounds a bit boring, but it can result in quite um, interesting tones. And then of course, because it's a voltage, we can also modify it with the LFO. And as I said, it, it, it um, can be quite subtle, but can also be quite harsh. Like we were, we're talking multi multiplying the, uh, the frequency of the main VCO, maybe up to three or, or more octaves. So this is what it looks like. So start off with the sawtooth. Let's set our threshold. And let's reset it, not only when the sawtooth itself resets, but when we reach this threshold. And the waveform at the bottom, that looks and sounds far more interesting. Now let's make the threshold dynamic. This could be um, manually adjusting it, say, or we can do it with the, with the LFO. And this is the circuit, comprises two parts. Uh, the lower op amp, that is the, I'm using it as a comparator, naughty boy, should use a proper comparator, um, but it's good enough for jazz. Um, so we vary the point at which we want to reset the sawtooth and the way that the, M110 works with external circuit to, to generate a sawtooth. 
as I said earlier, it has a DC output that charges a capacitor, and then the timing waveform resets it. So all we do is have to add another reset into the existing circuit, and we're done. Um, but as you saw on the previous slide, when we um, go back there, when we uh, bring the threshold down, we're going to lose amplitude of the sawtooth because it, we don't allow it to go so high, as you can see here on this slide. So to compensate for that, we have another op amp with um, a, a dual gang pot, and that adds a bit of gain to make up the, the loss in amplitude. And finally, we have the sub oscillator. This is uh, a one chip solution. It's based on a 4024 ripple counter. Basically, we take the square wave outputs from the main voice circuit and we divide it by two or four or eight to bring it down a few octaves. Um, I didn't have any room on the front panel for an extra switch. So in, in, in this case, it was hardwired to, I think, two octaves down. And then that was then routed through the, um, the, the noise switch on the front panel. It had three positions, off, white, and pink. Well, off seems a waste. So I just wired this through into the off position and we can choose it. And this is really what's going on. We have our input, that's from comes from the uh, clock. That's our square wave output from the voicing circuits. And then we just divide it by two, four, eight to go down in the octaves. And here's the circuit, 4024 CMOS chip, so we can run it off the 12 volts directly. So that's the walkthrough, I think, of uh, the main changes um, that I made to this uh, interesting little Italian stallion. Um, it's been, it was an interesting journey. It, it really opened up some interesting ideas because it, it, it it, it's hard when you're de designing from scratch because you're always thinking, well, I'll just do what I need to do to get a product out the door. But when you don't have those constraints, you can sit back and be a lot more creative. And I can, I, I can understand why a lot of these modifications did not make it into the original product. It was a low price, high volume, almost consumer electronics item. So price is very much a key here. And so what you get is the, in some ways the bare minimum, but um, they did push the boat out a bit. So I think there was a fight between engineering and marketing. Um, a lot of these modifications are very easy to understand once you can see how to add them into the existing circuitry. And this is for those who are new to electronics and coming into the world of electronic music. This is a brilliant way to learn about electronic music circuits. To start off with a synthesizer that is relatively simple, so it's very easy to understand. Um, as I said at the start, you can almost get an an introduction to op amp textbook and that will give you enough information to design these circuits and it's not hacking or circuit bending this is all comes from applying basic theory and ultimately it's all about having a lot of fun <laughs> once you've built these circuits and put them in then you can have fun with it and share that fun um with uh, with other people with other in you can give talks to the AS. And talking about sharing, um, anyone who's in the UK or even outside the UK around July, August time, um, like pitch here, <laughs> um, in Cambridge, you organize um, a synth DIY event where like-minded individuals come together and talk about this kind of stuff. And it's hosted in Robertson Cottage, um, free entry. And this is just one example of uh, someone's home-built synthesizer. Um, built from kits, but designed by uh, the person who actually bought the SX-1000 from a chap called Tony Allgood. So thank you very much. That's me. That's right. Um, thank you very much, um, um, Neil. Uh, very interesting. Um, sorry, I'll get my... Uh, vision on as well um i'm not entirely sure exactly what, we don't have to jump 
um, ship this time to bring in questions. Um, and I think the idea is um, we become a, a Zoom meeting. Is that correct, Sue? No, I think what we're going to do is um, the panelists, as in you, me and Sue, can promote everyone to a panelist as well. So basically bringing everyone onto the stage and we can all join in. So uh, okay. let, me, let me just, let me just um, stop sharing my ah, slide. Right. Uh, I can see how to do that. I can yeah. just allow people to talk. So I'm going to work through allowing people to talk. You should notice because you'll become on well, the screen. Promote to panelists as, as well. Allow well, to talk, yeah. There we go. Team effort. So, um, where are we? Have we got everybody allowed to talk? Um, so everybody should be able to unmute and video on and join us. Right. Um, Perhaps we can promote to panelists as well. I don't know whether we have to do that, um, but um oh, attendees you. okay oh i see okay so we're going to okay right okay there is a um there is a see, raise hand button um so if we can use that i can take questions um i was going to ask did you don't have another example of what it sounded like after you uh, uh i i yeah I, I i do have some audio but uh i didn't want to scare anybody uh let me see if i can some... i think we all want to hear it after all that yeah uh, let's um just kill powerpoint it's not, so I'm just trying to, yeah, so, um, one second, click, 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 and so this, uh, I, let's see if you, you might better hear it. Right, I just had a note from Sue. Um, uh, you do need to accept, I mean, if they, uh, um, uh, if I, we promote you and let you uh, be talking. So I think most people are allowed to talk at the moment. Okay. We promote panelists, you can actually participate in the meeting. Um, yeah. I've got everything. So mm -hmm. are you um ready to i can now I've, I've, I've got a recording i made that demonstrates the um uh the self-sync it, 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 it's quite brutal but uh, let's okay. uh, share sound yes because it's going to be fun so what i'm doing here is just playing a, f a few notes and then about halfway through i change the threshold and you can hear it um you can hear the sounds I, i'm just Playing the notes and then changing the threshold of the self sync. And it's uh, stand by your speakers. You might want to turn the volume down a bit, <laughs> just in case. Don't blame me if this, this blows out your speakers. What's going on there uh, is, could, could everyone hear that? Haven't blown out everybody's speakers yet? Yeah? No, no, I could hear it certainly. 
Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I uh, I actually found a bug in Zoom. I, I was giving a talk uh, at work on audio uh, technology, and I did um, I played a twenty hertz to twenty kilohertz audio sweep through a loudspeaker into a Zoom laptop, and basically it killed Zoom. <laughs> it just oh crashed, and they had to restart the presentation. Um, yes. So what was happening there is um, as I was sweeping the um, the threshold lower and lower and lower. Of course, what that causes is the sawtooth to reset earlier and earlier and earlier. So the result of that is that you get many more uh, sawtooth edges during the same period of time. So the, the whole pitch goes up, starts to scream, and then the variable gain amplifier compensates for the loss in amplitude. So it, 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 it doesn't get too too quiet otherwise yes it would get very very quiet at uh, extreme ends of the range cool um can we have any more uh, some questions from the floor before i start asking mine anyone got some questions there austin i've got one yeah can you hear me Yes, we, I can hear you. Yeah. Hi there. Um, I personally don't own a synthesizer yet, but I'm super interested in getting one. I had a roommate that had a synthesizer, a couple synthesizers and a drum machine. And I'm just wondering what you might recommend for an early user. I know you said something simplistic, but is there any, um, I don't know if you're agnostic or whatnot, but is there any model or specific, um, you know, easily accessible synthesizer out there that uh, early user would benefit from? I would get... Ideally, um, to, to, I would say there are two things. One is um, the older the better. And the reason I say that is because uh, just the technology used to, to make the synthesizer. Um, when the SX-1000 came out, it was all through hole technology. It's large, it's easy to work on. You don't need a microscope to see the components. Um, Unlikely, if there is a microprocessor, it's probably going to be a six i uh, a Z80, but you don't need to go there. Um, so it's mostly going to be analog electronics with some basic digital in it. So it's very easy to understand, very easy to repair if you uh, if it's non-working, which they may well be, um, and also it, it's easy to understand. Um, so even if you don't have aren't able to find the uh, the schematics anywhere be it online or uh, one of these manual companies it, it it wouldn't take too much effort to manually reverse engineer to draw out the circuit and then as i said hit the hit the textbooks and you can pretty much spot the the, the basic building uh, sort of blocks that are going on um and and i would say an, another good resource for this and again thanks to the internet um, hobbyist electronic magazines from the 70s and 80s, they had a lot of synthesizer projects in them. So um, there's one famous one, I would say, the, the Transcendent 2000. That was published in um, a, a, a British magazine called Electronics Today International. That was designed by a chap called Tim Orr, who um, quite famous in, in the air, in the um in that particular industry in the UK, he 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 designed uh, synthesizers for EMS. Uh, he he went on to to run Akai in the UK for an, a number of years. Um, he designed a range of synthesizers that were, that were published in these magazines. And thanks to the internet, you can now download them. So there's a website. I think it's called American Radio History. Uh, I've just dropped it into the um, chat, Neil. It's called yeah. World, World Radio History. Dot, dot com. Um, Brilliant. That is an amazing resource for old um, uh, articles, uh, yeah. as well as the ETI one. This um, ETI also did of a coder and a string synthesizer and a couple yeah. of other bits. But electronics, practical, popular practical electronics, another UK magazine. Seen did a very interesting modular synth starting from about 1973. Mm. I remember that because I was buying the copies each month avidly and reading them. Yeah, uh, there was also and, um, ETI and Maplin got together and produced the a, a range of 
synthesizers. I think there was the, the, the three eight thousand, the four six thousand. They were an Australian yes. design, and they were quite huge and a, a very strange architecture. Um, what else was there? There was a magazine. Elector. E Elector, the Elector Formant. That was a modular synthesizer. Then, and, and all these resources, Austin, you can, you can now find online, thanks to a lot of effort of people put in to scan these magazine articles. Coming back to your question of which synthesizer to look for, um, I'm, I'm agnostic, really. I, I'm, I mean, if you can find an SX-1000, brilliant. Um, but there are others. Uh, Korg came out with some small synthesizers, the MS-10, MS-20. Um, Yamaha did as well. Um, a whole range of companies did. Um, I know my friend has a Moog, um, a really small little Moog as well. Yeah, um, oh, and there's Moog. Moog Rogue. That's really quite a Moog. fun little yeah. synthesizer. What I would say, though, is um, I think you'll get a better deal on broken instruments. Um, best if they're not physically damaged, just um, a, a dead chip and like with the, uh, the SX-1000. The reason I say that is that people have woken up to these and are starting to go, hmm, actually, this is quite valuable. Um, and I know that there's a, a, a group of people in, in Italy who have woken up to the fact that years ago in their country was this powerhouse of um, synthesizer designers. And now they're quite keen on collecting and restoring and, and um, playing with these instruments. So um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it, it's definitely worth hunting and definitely worth playing, um, uh, uh, paying a bit, you but don't know, go did, too mad. Did, did the company that made the synth you've got, um, did they make electronic organs and things? Is that how they got into it? Yes, I mean, it's synthesizers and organs at that time were, were kind of um, an interesting pairing. You, you tend to find companies that built organs also built synthesizers because it was um, a market. They could sell keyboards to gigging musicians. Quite often what you had was you had an organ for doing the, um, the, the sort of main work. And then sat on top of that, you had a smaller monosynth for doing the weird swoopy wibbly sounds that people wanted to hear. Um, the Jen came out with the SX2000, which is a completely different beast internally, but that was very much designed to sit on top of an organ. Um, it, it's, it, it, it really was designed to, to be a, a brick that sits on top and it was much easier and had, had, had um, tabs for the, uh, the organist who was more familiar with that kind of interface. Um, but yeah, and, and yeah, um, l lots of magazines. Um, there's a lot of information out there now on building your own um, modular synthesizers. There are companies selling kits, for this kind of stuff. So there are now a lot of resources out there if you want to get into uh, building electronic music uh, gadgets. <laughs> Gizmos. Awesome. Thank, thank you for all the uh, resources and whatnot. I have them all in these numerous tabs here, so I can go look into that. Um, I also wanted to ask um, what your thoughts are, um, if you have any experience with drum machines, and maybe what's your thoughts on, I had a friend that recently got a cheaper Behringer, um, I think it's called like the Acid Machine or something, kind of focused on Acid Techno and the squelchy sounds in that. Um, what do you think about these kind of, you know, more cheaper option, newer equipment like that? Um, not that this is kind of separate from the synthesizer, but I've always wanted to do kind of like a live set with a synth and a drum machine, kind of like Jeff Mills style, if you know who I'm talking yeah. about. Uh, yeah, so uh, what's your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I mean, these, these it, it, it's ironic. I mean, way back in the beginning, the um, these little TB303 and SH101 that came out of Roland, they were sold as cheap as chips, little wiggly nasty little sounding boxes to go with with, with organists so that they were designed at a very low price point um, the very talented Roland analog engineers were able to squeeze performance out of not very many components and originally when they hit the market they kind of sold a few and then went flat and music stores were selling them off 
to get rid of them. And then the, uh, uh, the dance craze music came on and suddenly everybody wanted these. They weren't made anymore, so a finite resource and the prices skyrocketed. <laughs> Uh, that people could, you know, if you had a garage of these new in box, you could basically retire. Um, now what's happened with the likes of uh, Behringer coming on board and mm, other companies waking up to this emerging market. I mean, you're paying ridiculous amounts of money for an old bit of kit. Um, I'm sure there'll be a few TB3, 3 and SH101 and there's foaming at the mouth. Um, is that a lot, a lot of people want that sound, and with modern technology, that, um, companies like Behringer can produce a similar sound for not much money. So you can have your full range of kit for not much outlay, and some people will complain, and say, "Well, this is, goes against you know, the the um, heritage of these classic instruments." But on the other hand, I say I think g g getting instruments in people's hands is brilliant. And for not much money, go out, make music, have fun, learn and enjoy. Yeah, that's then kind we... of my that's my mindset right now. Is you know, get cool. into it and you know, get the you know, get the cheaper option and whatnot, and you know, play with it. And then and then my eventual goal on my birthday is actually September 9th, um, which is nine oh nine. I and I love the sound of the nine oh nine. So when I make it big, I can and I have six thousand pounds to spend on a nine oh nine. Then then I can get that much later. But uh, um, for now, I think you know, going into the smaller, uh, smaller players and, you know, the cheaper options, I think would be uh, in my playing field right, yeah. right now. Yeah. I wouldn't say cheaper, oh. I'd say l l lower cost. Exactly. I like the way you said that. <laughs> so other questions, people. Um... Anything on chat, let's have a look. Oh, yeah, so just some links in there. Thank you guys uh, very Susan's much, by the way. Question. Oh, no, it's a pleasure. Susan? Yeah. Um, nice. You know, keep it simple. I'll leave off the stupid, but uh, as you say, it's much, much easier to start without having a blank piece of paper. I mean, unless, unless you're actually doing it for your primary. Mm. Um, so you've shown us a number of different mods, each one pretty much independent, once you've got the base bit going, yes. the basic, not base as in. Um, did you did you actually do the whole thing in one fell swoop and just sort of, or, or, or did, did, it, did it happen in stages over a period of time of few got that done and then a few months later thinking mm -hmm. um no no it was over quite a, a relatively short period of time um i'd had i got the the m110 up and running the m110 emulator up and running got the software debugged and that was all going and then it, it, yes I, I reached a point where i thought now i can have some fun with this and pouring over the schematics, I started to build up a shopping list of, of the kind of things I wanted to play with. Um, I think the first one was sorting out that noise generator. I, I, <laughs> I, I think I pulled the chip out, threw it across the, the room, and it, it embedded in the carpet somewhere. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I just, you listen to it, think, and this is awful. This is not a noise source. So um, that was one of the first things I did. And then, some of them were obvious, so um, messing around with uh, the, the filter envelope and um, the, the noise source, the filter envelope. There was there was a whole range of other minor modifications which I made sure I didn't talk about. So I tweaked the. Uh, I mean, it was it was things like you go through the audio path and you see right here's a DC blocking capacitor. Okay, feeding into this relatively low resistance input so that's a low pass filter uh, uh, sorry a high pass filter so that's 
losing the low end, so I'll just increase the size of the capacitor and the sound starts to come alive because it's got more bass to it. Um, so that was most of the modifications. Some of them came out, it's sort of, you're sitting in the bar with friends and you're talking about stuff and then you think, but that pin on that chip isn't being used. I must be able to do something with that. And that's where the, the, um, the self-sync came from. Because uh, it uses, uh, the, the 4013 is, um, it's a D-type flip-flop, I think. And that's used uh, to generate the, the uh, to trigger, to generate the sorted. But it's also got a reset input. I thought that pin isn't being used. So there we go. Um, that was most of the mods. And then actually there's quite a few years of not, of not much activity. And then I was reading this uh, paper by, um, uh, 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 by Emily. And I thought, I could do something with this. I mean, a low pass four pole filter, low pass, only low pass. So then you start scribbling things out and um, sketching out and you think, well, yes, you get these terms and you can arrange them in this way. And then you, you think, oh, okay, I can do it. Now the question is, how can you do it with as few components as possible? You know, it, it's, it, it, it's like the old saying, it, it's easy to write a long letter. It takes a long time to write a short letter. Um, so actually making modification with as few components as possible using what's already there um, was uh, was the challenge. And I think I did it with as few components as I could get away with. And I, I even, um, and then of course the question is, well, where do you put the switch that controls the filter mode? Well, there was no room on the front panel, but on the back of the SX1000, um, it has um, two little holes for, for putting a music stand in. So thought, let's have a look at these holes. And it's just the right size to put a rotary switch. <laughs> so reusing what's already there. Did did the low pass filter in the SX have a um, Q control? Could you? Um, yes. You, oh, so you yeah, could so, do the sort of yeah. noise then. So um, right. it has a, a, a positive feedback from the output back to the input. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, and certainly not with a lot of filter designs, each of the integrator stages is non-inverting. Um, oh. Most filters that use OTAs tend to be inverting. So as with two or four, the phase is, con is, is consistent. But because all of these stages were, were non-inverting, I had to modify the the maths uh, in, in Emily's paper to to work around that, but but yeah, it's it it it's got a global feedback back to the input, and it does resonate. And unlike some authors who publish in magazines, uh, the filter can be pushed into self oscillation. Mm -hmm. Just need to give a bit more cue than it was originally set up for, but 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 yes, it will oscillate. Um, if you push it. That's interesting because the original Harold Bode filter in the Moog synthesizer, you could push into oscillation as well. Mm. Um, and that was, and, if I remember yeah. right, four pole to begin with. Um, yeah, if that was the uh, transistor ladder filter, I think you're referring yes, to. Yes, that's right. Different yeah. I think so it's that, that... a four, so if I remember yeah. correctly from the circuit, I remember looking and saying, oh, that's a four pole filter, that is. Mm. Um, but that had the same thing. And I think it was actually a voltage controlled Q control as well, because yeah. Moog had this whole thing about everything could be used as an input and a control voltage sort of thing. Exactly. Yeah. A, a okay. good friend of mine, uh, a, a good friend of mine, Tim Stinchcomb, um, has analyzed to death <laughs> the uh, Moog uh, transistor ladder filters. He's got a good website and a, a write up on. on on analyzing it to infinite detail. It's a really, really detailed piece of work. Who's that? Yeah. Tim Stinchcomb. Let me just, uh, I hope he doesn't mind me. Um, so, I mean, I, 
presume this uh, the mod for the AT Mega, which is skating dangerously these days close to an Arduino project. Um, was that was that actually a commercial enterprise on your part? I mean, were you was it were they built and sold or? Sorry, what was that? The your M one one zero. Yes, so um, I, I the first one I made was 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 just for myself. So it, it was quite um, yeah, it was it was a bit of a usual prototype circuit board wires hanging off it and stuff but it, it, and then I tidied it up for second uh, revision and then a few people started asking me about it so I did make a run of a few of them um, and there was some interest and uh, there was a few people who I know I because as quite a lot of people were interested in adding MIDI to their SX1000 but they didn't know one end of a soldering iron from the other so I would take theirs and fit it for them um and as i said in in recent times there's been um a growing interest in these italian synthesizers so i'm in the process of of uh, coming back to that old project and hunting through hard drives to find the cad files and <laughs> wondering how i'm going to convert them into something a bit more modern but um i'll i'll get there so it wasn't um, a tape artwork then for the circuit hmm? board layout. It wasn't a taped. No, no, artwork. I, I think originally I used what I used? I used Eagle. That's why the board is is well. I mean, the, the the board has to be quite small because it goes underneath the keyboard. Um, but also the free version of Eagle is is sort of limited to a, a smallish board. I think eighty by hundred millimeters or something. But that was. Yeah, it was quite cool. What is Eagle? Yeah. Sorry, I don't know what Eagle, Eagle is. is um is a um, schematic and PCB CAD software that was, at the time, it was produced by a German company called CADsoft. All right. Um, hmm. then, then they, after I was using it, they were then bought by Farnell. For some weird reason, don't know. Um, this is in, this is when Farnell and RS and DigiKey and Mauser all wanted to get onto the the CAD bandwagon as a way of selling more, more parts to us. And they kind of most of them have moved off that now. Um, but then CAD Eagle was then sold to oh um, Autodesk. Oh. So now it's part of the Autodesk Fusion environment. So I wanted to ask some, I mean, the, the analog circuit design was rather interesting. Um, sorry, if people have other questions, by all means, stick your hand up and I'll give you the floor. But I am interested in your your emulator chip because mm. to my mind, that was the that was the key thing you had to do. Um, and there were two things. I mean, all right, you used an AT Mega, which had, were you programming in something assembler or Tiny C or something? Um, so there's a, there was, and it, it's still going now, a project support GCC onto these all right. machines. A sterling effort um, to make GCC compile code for these tiny little 8 bit. Well, they're, they're, they are 8 bit, but in the case of the uh, the uh, the AVR series from Atmel, they're actually designed to support C, so they've got a, a big register bank. I think oh, right. 16 8-bit registers, 16 32-8-bit registers, so you could pair them up into 16-bit for pointers and stuff like that, so it, it, it's yes. a, a small I... micro design for C. Weren't they in, in originally intended to sort of challenge the PIC chip at the time? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So the AVRs came out of a Swedish company, I think, Nordic um, mm. company, um, and that was one uh, originally run by Atmel. Now, of course, <laughs> as in all these things, um, they were bought by Microchip. Yes. So, so um, it's all one company. So, now. I mean, obviously, things like the the keyboard scanning and stuff. I could see how you did that. Um, 
the MIDI, did you write that from scratch or did you pull yeah. in a, a MIDI? You did. Wow. Um, uh, how did you manage the current? Uh, because I noticed in the original M M M110 chip, there's a, a current sync or draw. Yeah, I think it's a current sync, isn't it? For yeah. control. Yeah. So, mm, so um, the we it scans the software or gets and actually in internally once I've scanned the keyboard, I just convert that into MIDI notes. It's just the easiest thing, and then I just merge both streams internally into the note stack. Controlling the oscillator does several things. One, um, so the way that the SX, the, this M110 worked, you had a high frequency oscillator running at about two megahertz. I, th I, th I think it was 2.0024 megahertz. But you could you could vary that to, to do vibrato mm. and tuning. And that was uh, generated by a 74 LS221 timer chip. Um, so that gives you your roughly two megahertz master oscillator. And then that gets divided down to, to, to generate the tone. In the M110, that feeds it in my emulator. So that that clock comes in. So it's the same clock. So all the tuning and vibrato and all that still works. That two megahertz clock comes in and drives one of the internal timers in the, in the Atmel chip. And so I program the timer to then generate a clock signal that goes out to a divider, uh, a, a 4024 divider chip to give me the four footages. <clears throat> and then, so that's just a, a one octave lookup table because obviously to, to go to low octaves, just divide by two or, or mm. divide by four, eight, so on. For the glide, what I actually do is um, I don't immediately update the timer. What I do is I have my starting note and the the or the the current note and the new note, and then the glide oscillator comes in and and, and it triggers an interrupt, and the in, in the interrupt operates a uh, a basic uh, sort of linear. Um, in, interpolator between these two values and it just glides from one pitch to the next. And that updates the timer to generate the pitch clock that goes out to all the pins. So it's. it's but the, the actual, because uh, it seemed to me you were saying the M110 had a current, a continuous current pin that was yeah. proportional to frequency. How did you, which is analog as far as I can tell? It uh, is. So. Um, I have a dual channel DAC, external DAC, which the, um, the these little at mega chips didn't have on board. So as a, there's right. a little SPI DAC, um, two channels of 12 bits, I think. And on on these DACs, they have, um, as in a lot of DACs, they have a lop amp on the output, so you can set the scaling. Mm -hmm. So all I do is, is put the transistor into the feedback loop and produce a programmable current sync. All right. So okay. the feedback to the op amp is just the resistor to ground, the, the current sense resistor, and the mm. transistor converts the app to the op amp into a current sync. Mm. And then um, I just control that from uh, another lookup table to generate the value to program into the, into the DAC. And the, the hmm. SPI interface runs a couple of megahertz, so it updates pretty quickly. Hmm. Cool. Um, and you mentioned the RT. So, I mean, I can remember doing real-time programming in C, and one of the things C didn't let you do was pick up interrupts very easily because they're a little bit different hmm. from a procedure call. So how did you manage that? Is that the thing your, R, your RTOS thing did? The RTOS, yes. So, so hmm? yeah, it's not so, a lot of space on a eight bit. No, it has for a real time operating system. No, the, the, this chip has um, four kilowatts of program space, and the software actually only the, the current software only occupies about a quarter of that. So, hmm. um, the the RTOS I chose because I, I I had looked through quite a few of them, 
and eventually settled on this one by a chap called Larry Borello, um, out of California, I think. Um, it's very, it is a true multitasking operating system. You can bounce between tasks. It's it's uh, fully preemptive, um, but by just using what I needed rather than the entire um, OS, it's got uh, some semaphores and some cues in it and uh, some tasks, and it also supports interrupt handlers. So you can tell GCC how to compile a function and um, the RTOS provides a, a, a low level library that actually captures the interrupt and then it it turns that into a, a preemption <coughs> call in, in the OS itself and then um, it calls out to your handler function uh, which can make oh, right. certain calls but not all of the calls so it can raise a semaphore but it can't wait on a semaphore for example because you, you don't want an interrupt handler to block so it, it can only no. poke things it can't sit there and wait so all, all i do is um for example, for the glide, um, the interrupt comes in, kicks a bit of code, and then as far as the interrupt is handler's concerned, that's it. And then the other code in normal space um, then picks up the notification and runs with it. Mm. Same with the MIDI as well, because that's a UART hardware block. So as MIDI bytes come in, they go into, uh, I think, one... Uh, level buffer that then triggers an interrupt and I have a serial driver that wakes up, reads out the byte, sticks it into the MIDI parser code, which then runs in normal time. Hmm. Hmm. So it, it was, it, it was a, using an RTOS actually made the design really, really easy because I'm, I'm sure it did. I'm sure I could uh, leave all the synchronization and stuff to the RTOS and just focus on here's a thread that does this thing here's a thread that does that thing there's a bit of communication between them let the artos worry about it and gcc being a pretty good compiler was able to get the size down to as i said it's about 2k words 2000 instructions mm. on um, the entire thing excellent um yeah very interesting um and again, it was it was it was one of those uh, challenges of, of 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 what's the smallest micro that I can really do this in. Um, <laughs> but just yeah, interest, you know. how much did it cost um, all in? I mean, probably more than an M one 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 zero chip did well, in its heyday. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, but I mean, a lot of the analog stuff was 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 just bits in my boxes of parts so that cost was very very minimal i think the only thing i had to buy really um was the atmel part um mm. and certainly for building the prototypes um companies like um maxim who supplied the uh, the dac had this wonderful thing it's called samples oh Free right samples. yes yes say, um, i'm at university uh, could you send me a couple of samples and they'll, they'll, they'll happily send you a sample or two right. Um, of parts, mm -hmm. um, transistors, yeah, just boxes of them. So just stick them in. I was just wondering, did you have to pay a premium for the seven four ones as vintage? Um... <laughs> yeah, uh, no. <laughs> Again, I have boxes of components um, that you can't see, thankfully. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> it was a case of what's in my junk box. Oh, it's one of these. Okay. I'm, I'm waiting for those to become uh, fashionable audio again, but I don't think it's going to happen. What? <laughs> or, or, guitar, or guitars. Guitar, oh, guitar right. uh, stuff. Several, several guitar pedals still use them. Oh, yes. Yeah. I mean, this like... is um, it, one of the interesting um, aspects of this is you look at a circuit and think, well, it, it has a certain sound that people know and love, and it has certain audible characteristics to it. And you look at the parts and it's things like LM301s and LM741s and, and 748s and lots of op amps, which nowadays you look at it and go, God, that's slow or noisy or power hungry or the slew rate. My God, I could 
Boil a kettle faster than that. I've actually seen someone simulate the slew rate in a software implementation of a guitar pedal to simulate emulate the 741. Yeah. For the uh, but then not for the lows, but for the yeah. sound. Yeah. Once you factor these <clears> in, you realise that th that's what's giving the sound. Right. And then you so, replace it with the modern part, and it, it all sounds bright and sharp and sterile. And where's the mojo gone? Well, you put a new part in. Mm. Yes. Right. So, um, I mean, the real time, th that RTOS you used, uh, did it have a sort of um, regular timer to, to stop it uh, if it did crawl into a little hole that could uh, reset it, so to speak? Or was it. Yeah, I mean, you, 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 you could. Yeah, I mean, you, 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 you could sort of set up things like that. Um, there was a watchdog timer as well on chip, so... You, That's you a just... watchdog timer. That's what yeah. I was, the yeah. word I was trying to get. Yeah, you just, just yes. have a hardware watchdog that every so often you, you can create a little timer task that k kicks the watchdog, and if it doesn't because you've wedged well, the, the chip will just reset, and it comes up pretty quickly within you know, mm. a few milliseconds. Hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad I'm not the only one who writes kick the dog in the comments of my code. Kick the dog? Yes. Watchdog. All right. The watchdog, watchdog, you know, every now and again, yeah. you've got to kick the dog. Otherwise, particularly if, you, if you're doing print statements over serial, you'll find that you, you rapidly run out of um, time. Yes. But, um, Actually, the printer at the other end decides it doesn't want to respond. Yes. Well, I, 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 the... I, I, just, I just run it at, you know, one, uh, one, one, five, two hundred. And... Yeah. All right. But mm. even then, it takes a surprising amount of time to mm. uh, dump down a help menu with all your commands mm. and things. Mm -hmm. But. Um, yeah, I mean, it's very impressive. I mean, the the amount of code you have to run that or the amount of code that you've not actually got to, to do all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, I, I've given up writing interrupt routines in machine code, but back in the day, I would write all the high level stuff in C and then the interrupt routines, I, I would very carefully hand code mm. um and i would i would use the c to do the interrupt um then grab grab the assembler code from that c call and then put my own yeah. stuff where i wanted what i wanted to actually do in there but leave the c compiler to do the call handling um yes, now, yes. That, yeah we, we uh, at um, Standard Telecoms, we did actually manage to write a, a complete vector interrupt handler for the LSI 11, which was our main sound acquisition board. And mm. we only had to um, basically go into the assembly code before linking to replace the RTS with a um, RTI so that it actually got back properly. Um, but uh, oh, that, I remember us doing that. That was quite an entertaining exercise. Uh, but uh, yes. Right, people, any more questions? Oh, well, I shouldn't say any more questions. Other questions, because uh, we've been hogging it a bit talking about this. Um, It's interesting you mentioned Tim Orr, because um, mm. my first ever synthesizer I got to play with was when I went to a Canadian university and repaired their VCS3, um, which probably was designed by Tim Orr, I suspect, or he had significant input to the circuitry. Um, it was, was, well, as all synthesizers were in those days, mm. somewhat sensitive to the no. question. Right, Lee. Um, uh, what would you like to say? Uh, uh, I can't actually. Were you? Have you not been hang about? Uh, I didn't realize there are a couple of people we managed to miss out being allowed to talk. Right. Okay. Antonio Leon and Lee. Sorry, you're there now, um, and uh, I'm really sorry for not. No getting, problem. Right, Lee. Oh.
Yeah. Tony? You you raised your hand. What would you like to say? Yeah, I mean, um, I'd say I, I, I know Timor uh, kind of personally as, as being an ex student of Timor. All oh, right. And uh, I think the, the, the VCS3 was actually before his time, a little bit. Oh, it's actually before his time. Oh, okay. I think a little bit, yeah. There's, there's, there's a little bit of timeline and the systems about it. And um, um, it, it, it's more, it did more to do with the Velcoda systems. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. That was more of a specialist yeah. subject. He had a little bit of, you know, dabbling some of the bits and pieces as well, which never came came to uh, um, kind of to light. But I think the, the kind of the the, the Powertrain two thousand, uh, you know, the the uh, similar to the um, since talking about now, I think that was kind of the design it did, and EMS didn't want it. Ah, right. Because, okay. Because they they didn't want a kit format in in the kind mm. of um, 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 brochure, if you like. So kind of it, w it went went to a magazine. Um, but yeah. Um, uh, uh, Powertrain Cybernetics picked up the uh, kit side of it. They did, yes, yes. No, they, I know, I know Tim did quite a lot of the other ones as well. Mm. Like the Transent DPX did that as well. Yeah, and, and the um, Polysynth. Mm -hmm. and... Yeah, and a few other bits, pieces like the Black Hole yeah. Coralizer and things. So no, they did quite a bit. And, and um, thing. I think he did the string thing as well, actually. I seem to remember. Okay, yeah. And yeah. I know he did a lot of well, colour. I've, um, I've got most of those magazines. because I Magazines, them. yes. When yes, and uh, it, 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 it did a lot of work with Chris Huggers as well. Mm. Uh, for Akai, the old the original samplers. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 I've, I've, I've still got um, an advert that Akai posted in, I forget which it was, Electronics Times or something looking yeah. for engineers to join Akai and uh, uh, please apply to Tim or at some, looked like a house address in London. Yes, it was, yes, mm. it, was, it, was, it was flat, yes. Yeah, I've still got it. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, no, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a little slot of doing design work, not particularly in mm. synthesis anymore. Um, it's uh, the only guys I've made any money out of it, the guys who played them. So... <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's still alive. And it's still interesting. No, it's still doing electronics, various, various bits and pieces. Mm. Um, but so, yeah, um, I think we've mentioned before on our kind of um, Facebook page that you're looking at doing like a version two yeah. of the MIDI interface. Would that be using like a more up-to-date processor? Um, or tried and tested technology, just kind of... Yeah, for, for the I, I did a poll and asked people do do they want it as a kit form for through hole or surface mount, yeah. and the overwhelming response was through hole. So okay. what I'm planning on doing is it's basically going to be a slightly modernised version of this. Yeah, um, there were the original version. It wasn't an easy drop in. You had to make a few modifications to the um, keyboard. PCB, yeah. um, because the keyboard scanning itself was only at five volts when it should be twelve volt tolerance. So, I'm, mm. I'm the the version two is going to be true drop in replacement. Okay. You don't have to make any modifications to the synthesizer at all. It'll yeah. just be M one one zero out this board in and through hole again, um, and uh, yeah, just an opportunity to address some of the issues that I had in the original. Um, yeah. Because it's always one of those, good enough, off we go. But there's always a, you, you, you always have a, a notepad of ideas you'd like to fix if you had infinite time and all this sort of stuff. So yes, uh, yes. There, there, yeah. There's a plan to um, address this, some of those issues. Yeah. And, you know, kind of, you know, as, as the system replaces the actual um, kind of um, generation side of the audio. Mm. Look at kind of improving what could be like, like a like a duophonic version, possibly or. Yes, I mean it's it's again it's one of those ideas. I mean I I mm. have weird ideas at times. Um, how would you do duophonic? I mean, capturing the notes is easy because I mean yes. either over MIDI or 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 um, uh, scanning of the keyboard. That is the easy bit. So how yes. do you do a phonic, bearing in mind you've only got one pitch output? So you start to think, well, what does it really mean to do geophonic? Well, you've, you've got a, a more complicated waveform. So yes. you're actually combining 
for synthesizing two clock sources at the same time. So what does that really mean? So yeah, it's 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 an interesting idea. It's something I've been playing around with for a little while. Um, I have another project, kind of <laughs> Italian things, um, yeah, a seal yeah. opera six that is- Oh is, yeah. Yes. Um, and again, that is a very weird, well, not very weird, but a weirdish voice architecture um, using programmable top octave generators to generate a sawtooth that drives the VCF. And I thought, could I play samples through this? And you think, well, if you make the sawtooth fast enough and re reset it when it's reached the value of the current sample, would would that sound like a sample? I don't know. Yeah. Experiment. No. But yeah, um, there's all sorts of ideas I want to do. Um, one thing I want to do is because in the original, I just hard coded or hard as just a number in the source code that says the MIDI channel. So if you wanted to change it, you've got to recompile firmware. Yeah. But I want to change that so that you can actually set it in the device and store it, um, store the sort of setting. You probably, like, probably kind of um, scan the keyboard on startup and just look yeah. at the keys being yeah. pressed. Something simple as that, can't it? Yeah. To, uh, and, uh, yeah, and as S Susan said, um, the Atmega 8 is back order until December. That's pretty good, actually, because last time I looked, it was next year. Yeah, uh, I, yeah. I, I think there are some of the some of the devices out there which are still uh, twenty twenty three delivery. Yeah, it's and, the um, it's the old forty nanometer and bigger um, technologies that seem to be the worst back ordered. Uh, you, yeah, you, you want three nanometers, you'd probably yeah. be okay. Yeah. Yeah. But you want that old technology. I do. I do stuff running in pulse power physics experiments lab stuff. And I specifically want the big heavy duty because they're much more noise tolerant when you get mm. mega ampere discharges happening a few meters away. I mean, there mm. is some shielding, uh, but it, you know, it's it it's still a lot of. You want a decent EMP. voltage, don't you? On so this, you on know, the logic <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'd run them higher than five volts if I could. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of problems with parts availability. I mean, I I I, I do boards based around the uh, you, you know chip, oh. um, and I mean, when when the lead times start going out, I I literally spent an evening buying few here, few there, just to make sure I actually had. Processes in hand. Yeah. Well, I I think the, uh, from what <clears> I can see, the semiconductor market now, um, the problems are shifting away from the big expensive chips because people have got them now. It's it's yeah. things like op amps. No one wants to. Yeah. Really interested in op amps? They're not sexy. You, you don't get much money for them. So you know who who wants to make them? Um, so it's proving quite a problem for um, certainly anyone who's doing anything with, with analog, um, mm. even if it's just to get it into an ADC or out from a DAC and then do everything else into digits, you still need to do the front end signal conditioning you know, related to the kind of work yeah. Susan does. You've got this signal and you want to buffer it and filter it and get it down to a, a sane signal before you feed it into the delicate precious little ADC and you can't buy mm. Well, you could always put a little transformer in there with a... <clears throat> yeah, I think even some of the smaller kind of support chips, uh, like the microchip, microchip, you know, the, the SIP devices, um, the ducks, and actually ADCs, they're getting, they're getting quite difficult to get all of them again. You know, they mm. seem to be dwindling stuck at that at the moment. Um, yeah. Some, some, yeah, some, yeah. Some, of the pro, some of the programmable lock outs from, from microchip, you know, the kind of really difficult to get hold of again 2023 delivery dates yeah it's it's the charming times um i guess more so for the big companies that need to plan and order tens of thousands if not millions oh. um for the the small hobbyists then we can be a bit more dynamic a bit more flexible we can order 10 parts and that'll keep us going for some time yes. Yep, and, uh, and you know, we get the, the, paying five p more for an op amp. Whereas if you're buying them in the millions, then 
every cent counts. It does, it does, mm. it does. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. What, what are the kind of projects we're looking at, uh, Neil, at the moment, kind of um, synth-wise, or do you have any other interesting other things and pieces you're looking at? Uh, I had lots of projects, and that's the problem. <laughs> Running time. Um, yes, yeah, so I've got the, the SX1000 is the current one. Um, yep. Then I've got the Seal Opera 6. That that that's that's a long-term project that's been going for a number of years. Yeah. Um, I I have an EMU 4K keyboard that needs a power supply um, attention because it's getting a bit intermittent. Yep. Uh, um, fairly cheap and, to buy because it's a standard yeah. off-the-shelf yeah. part, probably. Yeah. Um, and also um, for my my probably the albatross project, the one that sits around your neck and always reminds you of its existence, simply because it's of its size, is a is a DDA mixing console, um, sixteen. Channel. Okay. Yeah. It's it's sort of two man, two person lift. Lift. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And I've got the console. <laughs> is that a transistor then, Neil? No, no, That's it's it's. Mostly TLO 74s and a few NE 5532s. Right. Yep. And, mm -hmm. and, it, and it, it runs them hot, plus and minus 18, so it gets quite toasty. Yeah, the, the uh, 5532s are like that. They the, the like who, to be who running the limits. What mixing desk is that one, Neil? Hmm? What mixing desk is that? DDA. Uh, Dave Deer. Oh, DDA. Yeah, 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 DDA. Went on to audience. Right. Uh, it's a D series. And it was originally, I think it came from a theatre touring company, because it originally came in this huge um, flight case that I managed to offload to someone as I had no interest in it. And um, yeah, it had a really weird back panel, so all those need replacing, and it smelt of weird substances. So <laughs> in the case of stripping <laughs> it down to the bare metal and plenty of fairy liquid. Yes. <laughs> with rubber gloves. Good. Yeah. So yeah, it's um, and then yeah, and then um, also I, I guess uh, yeah, it's 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 also fun collaborating with people. So th through these projects and stuff, people got to know me, and it's just we ended up collaborating on various projects as well. So that, that that's always um, a fun thing to do. Yeah. 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 Cool. So, you know, We've all got those rainy, rainy day projects uh, at the back of the garage somewhere to uh, dig out when one gets bored. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, Stephen, Ahrens, do you have uh, any questions or comments? Um, just making sure everybody gets a chance to say things if they want to. Nope. I think mm -hmm. Austin had already chatted, hadn't he? Yep, yeah, Austin's had a good chat about that. Um, Mike of... Turner, Turnier. Still, still here. Just, just muted. There was quite a lot of background noise, so uh, I didn't right. want to impose that on the on the proceedings. But yeah, great, great talk, Neil. I enjoyed all of that and some good. Good memories of uh, Electra and ETI and all those things. I, I never built the synths, but I always used to look at those. But I'm just impressed at the the uh, you know the, the the what's if I can call it software uh, masochism in in trying to do that in in you know in a small in the smallest possible part. <laughs> Which, I mean, but but when you think of all those home computers that were made out of one megahertz. 8 bit CPUs and a few external chips because of costs and what they were able to achieve, all the graphics and processing and keyboard and talking to tape drives and all that sort of stuff. And then when you think of comparing that with um, a processor with many more registers running at a higher speed with built in integrated things that you can only dream of. Um, yes. In, yeah. In those days, in one chip. Yes. It's it like well, this is an entire yeah. home computer in one chip. The guy that designed the six five zero two wanted to integrate things. I mean, that's mm. uh, that's you know, and bring it in at a cost way less than the sixty eight hundred 
Um, I my co one of my co PhD people persons wrote an entire radio astronomy receiver mm. for three channels um, based on um, uh, sixty eight hundred ra uh, running at one megahertz. Mm. Yes, you say that to the youth today, they won't believe you. No, that's, <laughs> it's it's just the 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 uh, the guys who did it in those days did it because there wasn't anything else available to them and uh, but, but but to select that sort of um um you know minimalist approach when you've got more powerful thing i mean we we had a we had a rule in in the software team when i worked at nedec that uh, basically nobody wrote any c code anymore because matlab and uh, autocoding was better at it than we were yeah. um and of course, it wasn't necessarily very efficient, and uh, and and one needed quite high cal caliber devices. But of course, they were cheap, um, yeah. and and are, and yeah. are getting cheaper. But yeah, you 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 lose a certain. Um, I, I guess it's like you know, analog design is is uh, capable of great elegance when you can achieve something with you know half a dozen parts when any fool could do it on a on a you know on a huge processor or on a huge array of stuff and uh, yeah. it, it's elegance in design that gets lost when you have you know infinite resources almost at your disposal and sometimes yeah. sometimes insight gets lost as well which is a shame exactly but yeah great fun neil thank you <laughs> cheers it was nice <laughs> nice seeing the 3080 that was an rca part originally and the mm, yeah. 3700 yes not seen those for a while in fact, we, uh, thinking about it, some of Tim Moore's designs, if I remember rightly, um, also used uh, operational transconductance amplifiers. Oh, yes. When they became yeah. Yes. Mm. Uh, um, we used to use those for analog interpolation of encoders, where uh, we got a, a signal off an encoder every so often, every so many degrees, 30 degrees or whatever, and you wanted a, a linear interpolation of position in the analog domain. Um, and of course, um, as the thing ran faster and faster, you had to have a steeper and steeper and steeper ramp slope. Mm. And uh, we actually mm. used to use a, an OTA to do an, an analog interpolation, which seems does seem like masochism now, but <laughs> in those days was 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 rather cool. Good yes. devices. I remember um, Chad and Chad years back at a former employer and uh, there was a need for a low cost fast um a to d converter so instead of buying expensive a to d converters uh, he bought um, a bunch of cheap a to d converters and a pic micro and just programmed it to rapidly trigger the a to d converters in sequence and then to read them out for later it was only to capture a first <laughs> signal um but yeah it was um i think yeah this is you using what you have to solve the problem at hand yeah mm. in a company where it took two weeks to order a resistor so it was like what have we got in the junk box okay oh, right. that must have been that must have been the great elephant corporation it wasn't gec marconi was it it, sure wasn't, like it, it wasn't GC Arcadia. Because they were a bit like that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, company I worked for, the company I worked for had a complete set of stores with basically everything you needed for a 50 watt amplifier, um, all the components, etc., etc. Well, they had all the resistor values, all the mm. capacitor values, were all available on free issue including the transistors and op amps you right. could just walk in there and pick up some and they just kept everything topped up mm. <laughs> also research lab so and and they expected people to build a few so. yeah yes it sometimes seems a dying art sort of designing analog with um, as few components as possible but i don't know it's an intellectual challenge Hmm. Let's change the day job. Yeah. So, it's also quite, quite uh, just when we actually span the, the, the realms of digital and analog, uh, as, as in the Chris Hoggett's WAS synthesizer as well. Mm. Oh, um, yes. you know, yeah. If you're using you know, the digital uh, chips there because they're cheap, 
yes. um, in, in a slightly different way to what they were designed. And in fact, I've used um, a CMOS inverter as an analog amplifier. Yes, you could yeah. do that. You could, mm -hmm. I remember, you could you could do all sorts of things with CMOS inverters. Mm -hmm. You could do it with a gate if you tie the, the gates together as well. Mm -hmm. Or have a gated amplifier, even. Yeah, they're pretty so, crude, but extremely cheap. And this is for a yes. TV application. So they got, when you're talking a production run of a, a million TVs, then mm. you do want to get the cost down. Mm -hmm. OK, everyone. Um, any more questions for Neil? Um, I think we're probably done then. That was thank you very much, Neil, for uh, certainly from for my part a fascinating talk. Um, uh, good, quite old school, but I like that. Um, and uh, yes, uh, I hope uh, next month we don't have a, a talk because it's AES convention time. So I can encourage you all to. Uh, uh, go to that if you uh, um, wish. Um, oh, and one thing, there is there is a, some form of DIY synth fest going on in Sheffield in the first week of October. Mm. That's, um, that's, yeah, that's, that's about uh, 40 miles from where I live. Yes. I mean, I was thinking of going to it, but unfortunately I have something else on the same weekend yeah. in Sheffield, which is really <laughs> frustrating. So, <laughs> Yeah, it's it's um, um from, I've been to the previous events since the first one. And uh, right. it's a bit of a kind of show and tell mm. with people's mm. collections, if that's you like. What it like to me. Uh, um, and Euro Rack are... and that style of stuff. Sorry? Is it Euro Rack Lee, that sort of thing? Um, well there's there's, there's, there's there's some quiet, you know, there's there's people that are fetching their collections in of other synthesizers, you know, like the um, uh, famous, you know, DX ones and Moog synthesizers. There's people showing what they've, oh, right. they've got themselves as, pri as private collections. Uh, some items for sale, and you know, the, 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 there's been quite a, a, a lot of Eurorack. Um, you know, the three Eurorack systems uh, in, 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 mm -hmm. in being bantered around. Uh, there has been, you, know, you can buy your own kit for mm -hmm. items before, completed modules, um, and there's there's, there's a Quite a bit of stuff. I think the last one, I didn't think it was particularly as good as the previous, the previous one they held. Um, but the, there are universities involved uh, trying to promote the courses. And I think there's the uh, the Dealey Derbyshire um, kind of society. They were there as well. Mm. Mm. Uh, and there's also talks throughout the day by guests. Um, you know, um, so there's quite some, just, you know, I think some quite famous people doing, doing um, kind of talks on the careers and what they've used. To, to kind of define their sound and how they do things, and um, we went, went went to the very first one, and uh, and after the main event, uh, the BBC Radiophonic Workshop provided a small concert at the local theatre down the road. Wow! For, 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 for about sixty people. So you know that hasn't happened since, <laughs> but um, but you know it, it, it's it's a good day. It's, it's a good day. You know, I won't say it's a full day out. Uh, you know, you kind of, um, but the talks throughout the day, the very oversubscribed people being there, uh, and sometimes you just queue up and, and you kind of like don't exactly make it into the talk. So I think they're looking at that this year as well to try and make it more accessible to more people. But it's good. And, you know, there's a lot of people there kind of bumping over every year. And uh, yeah, it's good. And the bar's open as well. <laughs> this is the one thing we can't do on Zoom. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, if I go, I suggest you leave your credit cards at home because there are things to buy. <laughs> Lead us not into temptation. Okay, That's everyone, not, yes. um, thank you for attending. Um, have a great rest of the evening and week, and um, thank you very much, um, Neil. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Indeed, here, here. Yes. Thanks okay, for the so discussion afterwards. Cheers, everyone. Hope to see you at another AS uh, uh, section meeting after October. Take care, everyone. Bye.
Yeah. Mm -hmm.